This is John Urquhart speaking. We got lots of tape. Well, John, I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about what you recall of the old Rossman Club building? Well, the first thing that enters my mind on the Rossman Club is the great big picture that hung inside of the front door of Sourdough Alley. It was about three by four feet, hung right over the fireplace. Wonderful picture. I can remember we wanted to take it out the time of the fire, and Tom Gilmore just simply wouldn't let us do it because it was insured. So we had to leave it there. The old club was a wonderful spot. Red carpet right from the front door into the one big sitting room they had there, a fireplace in the hallway, which was a great big hallway, and then another fireplace in the sitting room. Well, then the card rooms were upstairs, and uh, along with the card rooms was several uh, bedrooms. Anybody that came in out of town, why, if they got stuck, they could always go to the to the club. Be well looked after. Uh, do you recall anything of the old bar that was in there? I imagine that was quite an elaborate uh, affair. It was quite a setup. It was to the right as you come in the front door. It was really set up. Was it all mirrored? And it was all mirrored, and uh, the doors were all glass, so as you could see everything that was inside of them. I imagine that was not in use in the later no, days, was it? No. And then, as I recall, there was a big billiard room. Well, there, was there? Right on the, the right-hand side of the, of the bar was two billiard tables there. That was a lovely room, too. too. Then upstairs, opposite the card room, was a quiet room. If you went in there, you just had to c take your magazine and keep quiet because they wouldn't allow any talking from anybody. This was for reading? For reading, somewhere. definitely just reading. There was a big fireplace in that room, too. Do you remember anything about the uh, decorations and uh, furniture, that sort of thing? Well, about all I can remember, the furniture, it was practically all great big easy chairs. Leather, leather chairs covered. Oh. And uh, as I recall, there was balconies, weren't there big veranda's? There a, yes, there was a big balcony overlooking the valley. Incidentally, the Rosson Club, right today, is the oldest club in British Columbia. Is it? Yeah. 1898. And uh, the present premises are still over the... Uh, well, the West Kootenai have got their power division there. Oh, yeah. It's right on that spot. Mm -hmm. Well, is, is the Rosson Club... Uh, Washed up now? Is it still oh, no. active? No, the, still the Rosson Club is up over uh, the Payless Drugs or uh, Variety Store. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, there, I think Jimmy Hunter probably is the only member left of the old club that's up there. I see. He still belongs. Incident incidentally, Jimmy and myself were the only two living members right today. Of the old club, when, uh, when I first joined, was 1924. Of course, Jimmy, Jimmy was there years before that. He can tell you stuff about 1917 that went on over there. I'd like to get Jimmy on the tape sometime, but uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to. I'm going to take this away from you. It's making too much noise. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, my best to talk Jimmy into doing this for you tonight, <laughs> but he just wouldn't do it. Well, maybe we'll break him down one of these days, too. <laughs> Uh, do you recall any of the, uh, well, the members prior to the fire in the Roston Club, any of the names of the prominent members? Well, there was, uh, at the time of the fire, L.A. Campbell was president, J.D. MacDonald was vice president, T.S. Gilmore secretary, and George Kent Sr. was steward at that time. Some of the really prominent members were Mr. Aldridge, the first manager for the uh, Cominco. He was a prominent member when he was here. S.G. Blaylock was another one. Uh, 
Douglas G. Turnan and Ernest Morrison. They were, were real old time members. F.S. Peters, he was another old timer. William Baker, that used to be insurance and real estate here. And uh, A.S. Goodeath, that had the drugstore. He started his store in 1896. Oh, yes. That was my mother's uncle. You're, I didn't know that. That's why she came out here in the first place. <laughs> uh, remember that, can you describe the outside of that building? I, I sort of remember it as a kid, it was a frame building, was it? Well, it was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that was those uh, six inch boards, you know, around, and then it was decorated with shingles every story. Oh, I'd say they were about four feet deep. Uh -huh. And uh, it was green, wasn't it? Green was red? Trim. Kind of a green and a red, a deep, deep red. I remember that. Uh, do you remember any particular functions that might have taken place in there that uh, you recall? Or was it just purely a, a refuge? Well, it was a refuge, all right. <laughs> But uh, the one thing that uh, came off every week, there was a poker game every Tuesday night and every Saturday night. Every week. I don't think it ever missed. Uh, uh, this club, of course, was destroyed in the 29 fire. Uh, everything was lost, was it? In, in the everything. Club? There wasn't a thing. There was, the register was the only thing that was taken out. That was the only, the only thing. Uh, I guess uh, you were kind of in the thick of that 29 fire. Do you remember, could you give us some of your recollections, uh, say how it started and how quickly it spread and how you managed to get the stuff out that you did get, where you put it when you cut it out? Well, I can remember it was on the last day of February and uh, just about 11 o'clock when the fire bell went. And uh, I went out to the street and looked down the street and it looked as if it was way up around where the faces lived on Washington. So I turned to Mill and I said, well, I'm going anyway because he's got a bunch of kids. And when I got down, I went through the store into the alley and it was burning in kind of a back shed there behind uh, Trembath store. Well, it spread from there. It just went both ways. And it just took the whole block. There wasn't any water. You, it was just a case of drag out everything. I remember we had showcases over behind the clinic, sitting in the alley. We got our books out, but as far as stock or anything, it was just hopeless. How fast would it have spread? Would it, uh any particular time, oh. half an hour, an hour? Well, we were down there from 11, and I can remember coming home at 4 o'clock. So it was pretty well known. Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember Eldred Jewell. There was a little pipe behind the drugstore, and we put a hose on it, and that brick warehouse that still stands in the alleyway, Eldred Jewell got up on the top, and he fed this hose around the edge of it on top of the brick to save all the the roof. And we were fortunate in that way because that was pretty well full of stock at that time. That was your warehouse? Yes. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine there's quite a wind with that fire that night, wasn't there? There wasn't too much. There wasn't. The first wind, when it came, it worked towards the post office. Well, then it switched and it went from the post office straight down the street and then there seemed to be another one come up after that and that's the one that took the club because it jumped the jumped the road and took uh, the building on the corner i think had a real estate office in it at the time and from there it went to the club I imagine the flames were really shooting up in the air were they oh it was pitiful see the corner the corner the store on the corner was three stories 
And when the top of that took and the shingles went from there over to the Rawson Club, you didn't have a hope. As I recall, they, uh, they dynamited one building that night, did they? Or was it two buildings? Just the one. Just the one. Yeah, they dynamited the one next to the post office. Elder Jewel did that. And this was to... Uh, Trying to break that building break because to, to keep it away from the post office. And uh, I guess that wasn't successful, eh? Well, it didn't do too much. I think it did save a lot of the post office, mind you, because the main part of the post office that went was the third, the third floor. Uh, we were short of water that year. That was the year the reservoir was down, wasn't yes. it? Yes. And uh, everything was frozen up. Well, the trouble that year was that we got frost before we got any snow. Practically every house. We carried water from away down to that old water tank on the railroad track. Right. One trip in the morning and one at night. Uh, Uh, do you, you recall the names of some of the merchants who were burned out that night, John? First from the post office was Weir's Dry Goods. Then there was Billy McNeil that had the gents furnishings. And then the drugstore, which we had at that time. And next to us was the theater. Hackney was running it. Then uh, Trembath had a confectionery store. And there was uh, the pool room, Sam Patterson and George Hunter. Then the um, McDonnell and Costello had a dry goods gents furnishings. Then Billy Baker had an insurance and real estate office. And next to him was the bank. And the bank was untouched? Uh, no, the bank wasn't touched. Well, what was on the opposite side of the street then that burned? Was that the old Crescent building? There was the old Crescent building, and then there was Tom Gilmore's insurance office, and then there was the three-story block on the corner. There was oh, Novak. So. Novak. And uh, I think Jim Cooper had a dry goods in that corner. And then the club. And then the club behind it. The club was the last to go, wasn't it? The club, club was the last. And uh, there was still no water to... No, the no. Darn thing. we never had water for on into April. And uh, did the trail fire department come up that night? Yes, trail fire department were up. I imagine it took them considerable time to get up here, did it? Well, oh, it did. They were, I'd say, a good hour. But it was hopeless when because there wasn't any water. They couldn't do anything. But they certainly were willing to try. So they just came up and sort of watched it go. <laughs> well, just the same as their own firemen. They well, the fact that it didn't jump Queen Street must prove something, doesn't it? Was, was that the result of the fire department, well, or was that just luck? Well, it was just luck, actually, because actually the post office stopped it from going any farther. See, that was brick or stone right on the corner. Well. When it reached the Rossman Club, it failed to jump the street there. There were some frame buildings on the opposite side. Oh, yes, it did. Well, at that, by that time, the wind had switched the other way oh, and was blowing the fire down the valley. So there was a certain amount of luck there, too. Oh, there was luck. There surely was. And anything that was saved was just sort of dragged out and shoved in the middle of the street, uh, as I recall. Is this yes, is that's right? right. Everybody... All the stores had dragged stuff out. There was <laughs> equipment of all kinds. There was quite a few people that got uh, a lot of clothes that night that weren't very expensive. Uh, well, was there was there any looting, or was this just uh, not too much? Uh, I remember Peter Dudney telling me that his father was packing furniture out of the bank in Montreal. He was never quite the same since. Yes. They, they did take stuff out of the bank. Oh, they? yes, they did. Actually, they were afraid that the bank was going to go. And then the post office moved into the basement of the bank after the fire, as I recall. Is this right? 
for a short time. I can't remember now, were there? The German told me that this mm -hmm. was so. And, uh, of course, the north side of Columbia Avenue, including yourself, was rebuilt before too long, wasn't it? Well, we built, uh, we started at the end of April. Right away. To build the drugstore. Billy McNeil built next. And then uh, Jim Cooper, he put the building up next to to the drugstore. And uh, there was a fellow, Kopecky, came in and started a billiard hall. And he built a building next to that. And it wasn't any time until Buterex built their building from there to the bank. And did Billy Baker build right away? Mm -hmm. Billy Baker did. He built after, oh, I'd say two or three months, he put the building up between the... Um, McNeil in the post office. And then, as I recall, the only one to build on the south side was Tommy Brown, was he? Tommy Brown was the only one. And he built right away after the fire. Yes, he it? did. Yeah. Uh, there's one thing I've been trying to recall, and George Kent couldn't recall either. Didn't we have the horse-drawn fire sleigh at that time, or were they using the truck? Do you recall? Well, they had horses. It was horse -drawn oh, definitely. Yeah. And it seems to me I recall Somebody saying that they had a little difficulty with the horses that night. They bolted when they were trying to hook up a fire hose there at the post office. Oh, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't see any of that. I was too busy at that time. <laughs>